Hello. Hi. Hi, Christy. I'm going to be helping you uh, with this presentation. Thank you, Miss Nancy. Absolutely. So you just let me know what you need me to do, okay? Perfect. Really just monitor the chat and let me know if we okay. have questions. Okay. So that it can be a little bit more interactive than me just talking. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a pretty necklace. Thank you very much. On Zoom, you only have to be dressed from the top up, so you never know what's <laughs> going on down here. <laughs> I was, we do like, I do Zooms with my family and we all were like sitting there and then I realized like somebody accidentally got up and I'm like, you don't have any pants on. <laughs> That's funny. So we, we sent out some Zoom etiquette and we were talking about it in an executive team. We were like, should we put on there no pajamas? I'm like, I feel like we still need to put pants on just in case you accidentally get up. <laughs> Hi, Aja. That's my friend who's always got her makeup slayed. She's my makeup slay sister. And no lashes today. <laughs> I know. Isla always looks beautiful. I've never seen her not beautiful. Let's keep it that way. Right? <laughs> That's why I tell people, I say, if my camera's not off, it's because my lashes are not on. And I don't have, yeah, there, there's no lashes and no makeup on today, so I can't, I can't ruin the image. Yeah. They keep me at all the meetings. They're like, did you really just come to this nine o'clock meeting in full makeup? I'm like, did you not? I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> Hi, Miss Tawana. All right, I need to make sure I'm recording. It says that you are. Okay, so I want to make sure. Well, they're gonna get a whole bunch of commentary, but that's me. <laughs> 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 Nothing wrong with that. Talking about Isla and her makeup. All right, so we got about two minutes to try to let everybody get on. Um, let's see. Make sure that your name on the screen is your first and last name. Because if you don't put your last name when we run the report for attendance, I don't know who that is. And we can't input it by just a first name. Also, in order to get attendance credit, you need to have your screens on. So I see a lot of you without your screens on. I know that um, some of the other leadership teams are going to pop in and out just to check and see that we're, we're all engaged and where we're supposed to be. Now, I will tell you right now, I am very kinesthetic, so teaching this way is like, I just finished the training, but it's, it's, so, I, it's not my norm. Like, this is not my natural bend to, to teach this way. If you've ever been in my workshops, you know I like to dance, I like to do hands-on, I have activities. So I am really gonna try to not be boring, but I hate PowerPoints. And I hate training like this, but you know, we can all learn something new. So I have to, I'm still, we're all still kind of learning how to make this really super engaging, which you probably seen today has probably been a little bit stressful with getting on and links and, and all that. Um, so that's why I just went ahead and sent you a link from my Zoom account. I thought it would just be easier that way instead of just trying to figure out which session and I couldn't even get on. So I didn't even know where, where that was at. Miss um, Deborah, Miss Beavers, yeah, I'm about to start a class. please make sure you have your cameras on, Miss Lauderdale. If you are a person, there were a couple people that did get exemptions for having on camera. Hi, Miss Sandra. If you're that person, just put in the chat room if you're having right, a technical difficulty. And you needed to um, not have your screen on for some reason. But remember, that has to be approved prior to this training. You can't decide right now. If you're having technical difficulties and you can't get your screens to work, that's fine. But you need to be my most active people in the chat room because I have to show that you were active and attending, okay? And the chats are recorded as well. They're included in the recordings. Okay, so Ms. Lauderdale, your computer's working, but your camera doesn't. Great. 
That's fine. So what I just need you to do, um, Miss Emma, is make sure that you are commenting and responding in the chat, okay? That way I can track your attendance throughout the session. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started because last workshop I was a little long-winded, which is pretty typical of me. So I'm really gonna try to stay on time. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christy Pinckney. I am the Director of Professional Development and Training. Um, I'm out of the Tampa office, but I work for all of you guys. Um, so prior to coming to Head Start, I did about 12 years in family services. So doing what you do. Only, but I did it for, for families that have children with mental health issues. So to me, that's like, one of the hardest ways to do social work when you have parents with schizophrenia and they're hearing voices and the kids hearing voices like how do you do a family case plan with this going on so i did that for about 12 years before i came strictly into education but i have a lot of experience in um in this area so if you ever need help or you have questions or you need an idea you can absolutely reach out to me i know a lot of the education people do but people forget that family services is where i started um, so we're going to talk today about the seven steps to building lasting community partners. I will also share the PowerPoint with LaShonda so she can share it with you. So if you're the kind of person that needs to just listen and not take notes, that's fine. If you're like me and cannot sit still for two seconds and these Zoom things are about to kill me and you need to clean or move stuff, that's fine. Just stay in your window screen. Just make sure I can know that you're there. I know you're listening. You're good, okay? Yesterday during the pre-service in Jacksonville, I was literally retiling my whole office floor. Like I could not just sit there and like, okay, okay. It was just hours, you know? So I, I just, I understand that. <laughs> I'm very kinesthetic. I need to move. So if you're better at moving or writing or doing something when you listen, please feel free to do that. But please just don't take phone calls. Pretend like we are still in a professional environment. So no phone calls. Um, I can't guarantee one of my kids won't walk in here at any minute, even though there's a sign on the door. But my eight-year-old has already come in here four times. And she's just like, I'm trying so hard, Bobby. I'm trying so hard. I'm like, just a little bit harder, please. A little bit harder. <laughs> so there's no guarantees what will happen during this training. <laughs> All right, um, so let's get started, y'all. Everybody can see the screen fine? Good, okay. So I'm going to put the chat down and let um, Miss Nancy monitor the chat. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to put it in the chat. Miss Nancy will um, stop me and ask the question, okay? Because I definitely want this to be more interactive. I'm, I'm not, lecture style is just not really my bent. All right, so where do we start? First, ask yourself four questions before you begin trying to start building a community partnership, okay? So what are the needs of your program? Where are the service gaps that a partnership might fill? What time are you willing to invest in the partnership? And who will take the lead with that partnership, okay? So we're really going to kind of break these down and look at them because if you don't know what the needs are, then you can't build a genuine partnership with somebody. For instance, if me, if I wanted to have um, Miss Alana, is that saying your name right, Alana? If I wanted Alana to start babysitting, right, if I wanted, if I wanted Alana to start babysitting my kids, like have a babysitter's club, a parent, and I wanted her to join into this club, but I don't have any of the information I don't even know what she would need to do. I just know I want her to join, but I haven't kind of laid those things out. She's gonna think I'm disorganized, right? She's gonna think I don't know what I'm trying to do here, and she's not going to want to partner with me, right? <laughs> because I haven't laid my own groundwork. So you need to make sure you know what the need is. And a lot of times the needs can be different based on the centers, okay? So let's say, um, Elijah, I say your name wrong all the time. Can you tell me how to pronounce it? Just think, Isla. Isla, thank you. Isla, perfect. All right, so let's say that Isla Center has a need for clothing. That may not be the same for Tawana Center. 
But in Iowa Center, the, the neighborhood that serves that particular Head Start that she sees, there is just an overwhelming need for clothing resources. So she may want to reach out to a community partner that fits the needs of her children. Okay, so I want you to think about your centers right now, and I want you to really focus in on what does my center families need? What are the needs that are coming up in your meetings, in your um, parent meetings? Then you're going to see where those service gaps are. So maybe we do provide mental health services, but we only have one mental health counselor, and she can't get to all the, the children and just all the families when I need them. So that may be a gap. It's a service that we provide, but there's a gap there because it's not available as much as we need it to be, okay? And then you need to look at the time that you're willing to invest because doing community partnership is an investment of your time. You never wanna be in a partnership where you're taking and you're not giving anything because people tend to not wanna partner with you for very long when you do that. So you need to understand, let's say, um, Isla decides she's gonna do a clothing partnership, she needs to make sure that that clothing center has a need that she's also supporting them so they will continue to support her families at her centers, okay? All right, and then who will take the lead? It may not be that you're gonna be the lead person on that because maybe you have too many families to manage, but you do need to think about that. Who's gonna be the lead person? Who's the lead contact? Because when you're doing a partnership with the community um, partner, you never want it to be implied that I'm the lead or implied that LaShonda's the lead. They need to know who their point of contact is for all communications. So you need to kind of iron those things out ahead of time. Sometimes you won't be the lead because maybe you have to be able to sign contracts and you can't do that. So you can say, I'll be the lead for communication, but anything that requires signatures or authorization, maybe that's LaShonda, okay? All right. Um, so needs. What are the needs of the families you serve? I just listed the, the pretty much the basic needs that we tend to see all the time, the housing, the food, the transportation, health, and financial. What are the gaps in the services? So do you have, what are the gaps that a partner could possibly fill? So what are we missing? What do we need? What do we do, but we can't do it to, the, to really satisfy the needs of our families? And then we talked about the time that you're willing to invest into that. So we're gonna look at some of these things in a little bit more detail in a second. So, and then the lead, who's gonna be the lead for, for the agency, for your agency and the partnering agency too, okay? So you always wanna make sure that you know who's the contact, who's the lead for both agencies. So I went to Pinellas and I wanted to just give a real life example. So this is a resource that's in Pinellas County for food. Have any of you guys heard of this? Mm -hmm. It's called, what is it? I, I can't see my whole screen, but. It's the called Feast, Feast, Feast Food Pantry. They're in Palm they, Harbor. So Feast food, food, food Pantry. So we're gonna look at them and use them as kind of our um, template today, thinking about making a, a community partner with them. So first of all, um, I always check to see, do you have money? <laughs> Are they providing services? A lot of times we provide families with that community resource list, but a lot of times those resources are very much based on when we have funding available. So it can be very frustrating to provide resources that are dead resources. I call them dead resources because I don't know if they have funding, I don't have a contact person, I don't know who the lead is, I don't know what days you have to go there. That community list is so dead to me. So some of you have been in the training with me before where I talked about making a resource binder and doing the contact sheets and updating the contact sheets, that's, you know, and writing on there the last time you reached out to them, because that's really important, especially when in your roles you're trying to build relationships with your families. And if you give me a referral to this food pantry, because I'm telling you, I have no food, Nancy, no food at all in my house. I need food. My kids haven't eaten in two days. And you say, go to the Feast Food Pantry. And I go there and they have no food. <laughs> and they're like, we haven't had food in like two months. We're still waiting on funding. The relationship between me and Nancy is, is very damaged right now, right? because I had a need, I went to her, she didn't even take the time to make sure this resource would work for me. 
So I'm not as likely to come back and say, hey, I need help with this or be honest about anything after that because that's an immediate need that you didn't even address off the bat. So let's look at the seven steps, okay? You know, you can write this down if you want, or again, I'll give the PowerPoint again. So these are the seven steps we're gonna look at. Connecting with partners, aligning, defining, building, promoting, ensuring, and tracking, okay? These are our seven steps that we're gonna look at today. All right, so first I would connect. You're gonna connect with other leaders. Go into the community partnership with the same mindset as any organizational alignment. You're gonna set the expectation for the resources. Each group will commit and follow guidelines to track the success of the partnership. So if we're connecting with the community partner, we need to connect based on this is a need that we need that can help us, right? Um, one of the things that I always suggest when you're doing connection, I don't know how you guys do it now if you send letters to community partners that are available in your, in your area, but I suggest a letter as a follow-up to a visit, okay? Face-to-face -face is always the best way. People get hit up for different things all the time, especially organizations that are providing resources. So Tawana's face coming in to my food pantry or my clothing thing and saying, hey, listen, I'm Tawana, I'm from Head Start. I have families that are really in need. I connect with her better in face than getting her letter because I may have gotten like five different letters this week. I just don't have the time to do that. I'm trying to run this resource over here. Another thing is when you're talking about connection is you want to find something to connect with them on. Because in social service, we tend to be super busy. We tend to have the feeling of this is mine. I'm giving it to you, which is not ours. We're not giving anybody anything. <laughs> but so for instance, um, Nancy did it when she, came on the, when she came on the training today. The first thing Nancy said to me was, I love your necklace. She is already my new best friend, honey. Like, I, am just, <laughs> I love some Nancy. So we connected already. So if you're going into a community partnership relationship, find a way to connect. And it can be just as simple as giving a compliment. The space is so beautiful in here. I love how you decorated this office. Or, or a compliment to a, a piece of jewelry, whomever you need to connect with. Because once I like you, I am more apt to work with you, okay? And they may say, oh, thank you so much for complimenting my necklace, Nancy. I don't have any opportunities for partners right now, but you know what? Maybe I could just add one more because I already feel like I like her, you know what I mean? So make sure you make those human connections. Everybody is a person. Everybody can be reached on any level. Another good way to do that is um, family pictures. If you see people with family pictures posted up or scriptures or any of those things, I always comment on that. Oh my gosh, your family is so beautiful. Now I'm not talking about being genuine, making up crap, okay? Like really be genuine, find something you can connect with and, and move with that to make those first connections, okay? And then you can follow up with your letter. Hey, thank you for meeting with me. It was so amazing to get to know more about your program. And this is how I plan to support you. If you can support me this way, we can meet again on this day or this day. So the letter is a follow-up to the visit, okay? Um, as family services workers, you really need to know your community well. So let's go back and look at this pantry in Palm Harbor. So the first thing is that I have on here is to reach out. So we're reaching out to them, but I wanna kind of do my research ahead of time. I really wanna know what they do. So on their website, it says that they need volunteers. So I can already pretty much tell if I want to get in with this resource here, I'm gonna to need to volunteer some hours here. Somehow I'm gonna to need to do that because that's gonna be my biggest bargaining chip to making a really good, strong, lasting community partner. If I say, okay, me and three of my face teams will volunteer once a month for an hour or two hours, if in exchange we could send you some of our families for food. That's great because most of these places are basing their revenue and how they do things on volunteers, right? So they're always in need of volunteers. So let's see. Let's see what else they got here. 
So the next step after you connect is aligning. Make sure that the goals of that program align with the mission and vision of ours. So obviously Lutheran Services is a faith-based organization. If you see an organization that's like, we're completely atheist, well, you know, that may not be the right alignment for us because they will have a difficult time really understanding our mission and vision. Um, if you go to an organization that doesn't value, for instance, if they don't value education, that won't work for us well either. Or if you go to an organization, for instance, that um, doesn't really have a lot of structure, sometimes new organizations, those can be difficult to partner with as well, right? Because their mission and vision is not even created yet. So let's look here. So this is the food pantry. This is what their mission statement is. It says that to be compa to compassionately provide food and personal care items for families in need in the North Pinellas County. So let's say that Charlene has families in South Pinellas County. This connection won't work for her, right? So it's not, a, it's not productive for Charlene to be the one making this partnership connection. It would need to be someone who has families in North Pinellas County. And it seems to be, you know, they say compassionately providing food, which is part of what ours, our um, mission statement is, is about compassion and how we work with families. So this is like a good alignment for us, okay? This is like a good partnership. Let's go to the next one. So now you want to define it. Define and prioritize goals. Make sure the goals and directives are clearly defined so that everyone is on the same page. So in the past, when I've done community partnership meetings, I have brought my case managers to the table and I've brought the community partners to the table. So for instance, um, in Tampa, there was a, a, a grant that came up for developing this particular zip code. So they had like a civic association, they built this huge building, but people weren't coming in there. The people in the neighborhood would not come into the building. So they cast my team to come in and figure out why the community could not partner with the families. Like they built this whole big structure for them and, and all these classes and programs, but none of them were coming. It was literally just sitting there. So one of the things that we did is I set up a meeting and I had family members on one side and well, not on one side, I actually blended them all in intentionally and the community partners with the resources. And I had them to have a dialogue. What do you need? Parents said, we don't go in there because it doesn't look like it's for us. It's super fancy. We're basic, simple people. Like it looks like something that's not attainable for our family. And they weren't really putting together resources that made the families attracted to it. So when you are working with a community partner, you need, you need to make sure they understand the population that we serve, the needs of our families, and how to approach our family. So for instance, if you have a lot of Creole speaking or Spanish speaking families, and you want to partner with an agency that doesn't really know how they could support that, if families came in, they don't have someone that could speak Creole, or they don't have someone that could speak Spanish, but you know you have a lot of that at your centers, this may not be a good partnership unless you can define a way to address those issues as they come up. So maybe you say, okay, um, whenever I send in my Creole families to your, to your establishment, Miss Ebony will come with them because she speaks Creole and she'll make sure that they're able to communicate their needs to you. Or Miss Melissa will take our Spanish speaking families and help with that. And they may be like, okay, great. But you always want to make sure that you're on the same page, okay? Just as accessible and how we are very culturally responsive to our families, we really want to look at agencies that define their goals and prioritize those things as well. All right, so the next thing is to build. Build new partnerships and strengthen long lasting, long standing ones. So you always want to try to reach out. You never want to say we have enough partners. There's no such thing. You always want to look for new partners. And then you always want to make sure that you are strengthening the ones that you currently have. 
by volunteering your time, making sure that you're living up to whatever we said we were gonna do, okay? And sometimes within Head Starts and different grant programs, funding may change, positions may change. One minute we have three faces staff that can go volunteer. Next minute we're down to one face staff. So as you're building and committing to relationships, you make sure that you're communicating those things so that the lasting relationships will stand, okay? All right, so this is back to the food drive, the food company. So this is off of their website. It says volunteers come in all ages, shapes, and sizes. Some volunteers come regularly, others help when they can, such as students, others working towards family, um, working towards volunteer service hours. So it puts on here things that they need, people to sort and package, people to help with fundraising, food drives, and assisting families. These are the volunteer opportunities that they have. So going into a partnership with them, this is information you're gonna wanna know, right? You might be like, you know what, hey, we could do a whole sorting day after hours or at the center or during breaks. That could be our thing. We can help with sorting. Or we can help by assisting families because we already do that. However it is, but you want to make sure that you're looking at these things. If they have websites like this one does, it's awesome to go on here and really see what you would be getting yourself into because you never want to be a lazy community partner okay partnerships is two people giving and receiving but not just one person taking all right so let's look at this one promote um, you want to make sure that you're promoting shared decision making and ensuring that you don't duplicate responsibilities so for instance, maybe Courtney is looking at a mental health partnership, but some of the things that they're saying they do, we already do. And she's finding that it's few and far between things that they could actually do that we're not doing. So you wanna kind of see, hey, what kind of things do you guys offer here? Okay, because that's gonna have to drive whether or not this is a good partnership, or if there's one thing they do that they're willing to do for us, you want to make sure that we're not, we don't want to ever do double work. So it's kind of just really defining what is available, what they offer. And sometimes people will say, well, we offer case management, but their case management may not be the same as our case management, okay? Like we offer wraparound services, which means we wrap around the entire family, not just the individual child. So you need to really kind of find out well, what is your case management need? And they may say a lot of agencies only work with the child, which astounds me because I don't even know how you can do that and actually affect any change. But maybe I go into Ms. Cynthia Davis's office and she tells me, um, we do wraparound services. I do tutoring with the child. I do this with the child. I'm like, do you do anything with the parents? Oh no, just the children here. So that's not gonna be a really good fit for us because we are encompassing our entire families, right? We know that you can't affect real change without impacting the circumstances, the culture, the children, their lives, the people that affect those things. You can't just do case management in isolation. All right. Next, we're gonna ensure. So we want to make sure that we're ensuring screening and referral protocols are seamless. So let's say that Miss Willie Harris, she and I have a partnership where I will provide tutoring for her children at Head Start. During COVID, I'm gonna tutor them in a certain, certain area, okay? And I'm gonna be bringing out res tutoring resources to those students that Miss, Miss Willie Harris has, okay? Well, let's say, she gives me a referral. We come up with a whole little sheet, a referral sheet. Whenever I am sending families to her or she's sending families to me, I need to make sure I am following that referral, okay? A lot of times when you build community partnerships, they will develop a particular referral form or process that is specific to that partnership. They may not be the same referral that would be used for anybody just coming off the street. It's a referral that may be specific to just working with Head Start. Or maybe we have one that we would prefer to use. Um, so we need to make sure that when we're doing that, that we're doing it seamlessly. 
that if Luis tells me for his program, everyone needs to come in there with the birth certificates of everybody in the household, their ID, and their pay stubs for six weeks. If I'm referring someone to Luis's program, I need to make sure that they have everything Luis said. Because what happens if I send them and they don't have it? Not only does the family get really irritated because they needed the resource, but then Luis is like, now that darn Deborah, I told her what we needed. <laughs> and she keeps sending families that don't qualify, that don't have what they're supposed to have, and there it, it makes it more frustrating for that partner, okay? And people don't tend to want to stay your partner if you make their work harder. Partnership is supposed to really ease some of the workload and share the workload between the two partnerships. So you want to make sure that you're being a good partner in that way. Nancy, do we have any questions I need to stop and answer? Uh, um, had just gave a suggestion that another idea is that we could put flyers inside the food bags or the food boxes that we mm -hmm. give out. Absolutely. That's a great recruitment method. You can get Lakeshore or other companies to help donate stuff. Any, and and the, the partnership will, will only grow because of that because they're like, you know what, Miss Tawana, she is very helpful. Like she's made, she got Lakeshore to donate 5,000 bags for the food. <laughs> That's a great way to help us because now we don't have to worry about finding bags, recycling bags. We got these really nice bags for the food and my partnership with the Head Start Faces helped us get that. So those are really, really great things to do. Thank you, Nancy, for the suggestion. Um, so this one is part of what their application process. So when we're referring families, you always want to make sure the family meets the qualification, follow up with the agency before making the referral, and help the family gather everything they need ahead of time. This makes for that seamless referral process that we were talking about. Because any partner that you have is going to want to see that it's running smoothly. If every time um, Miss Melissa sends me a Head Start family, they don't have nothing they're supposed to have. They don't qualify. They're asking me if they can bring it back later. I just can't work with this. Like, I, you can't make it harder for me, okay? I need it nice and simple and easy. I'd be like, Melissa, listen here. This is not working out for me. So this is the food, um, the feast food. This is what they say you have to have. You must live in Palm Harbor, Safety Harbor, Crystal Beach, I don't know what the zone, I've never heard of Ozona, Osmar, Dunedin, and zip code 33761. So if you have families that live in this zip code, they would qualify, but it also says they must um, fall within the income guidelines, which we know that our families do that already, right? Because we require that for a head start. Sorry about that. Um, and then here's the required paperwork that they want you to have. So security cards for every family member, proof of address, which is a driver's license, utility bill, or current with the current address on it. So they didn't say that I can bring my voter registration card, okay? They want these two items. They also want proof of income. Social security, pay stuff. So you want to make sure that you're helping families get these things ahead of time before they go down there. That way this partnership remains strong. Another thing that I didn't put on here is you also want to um, follow up with the family. So let's say I sent Miss Carmen. I sent Miss Carmen to get food from this place, from the feast place. I gave her the referral, we followed all the things, she met all the qualifications, but when she gets the food, half the food is expired. It's not what they said it was gonna be. It's not enough for her family. And she had to wait like three hours. They lost her referral, all these things happen. So it is very important that when we are building community partnerships that we are also following up with our families on the effectiveness of this partnership. Is it working? Is it me? Oh my God, that baby is so cute. Hi. I'm sorry, I saw a baby. It was like a squirrel. Anyway, sorry about that. It was a cute baby. So we want to make sure we're following up with the families. 
because you do want to make sure that there are the referrals are effective. One of the things that I learned when I was doing case management is in Hillsborough County, I don't know if it's in Pinellas, they had a program for transportation, which is a big issue for our families. And what they would do is if you had low income, you could get a vehicle for like $300. And maybe your car payment was like $50. Well, actually, I think the vehicles were free, but you, so you know, there was no down payment, but you paid like based on your income, $50 a month for a car payment, stuff like that. Okay. Or you could also bring, if you had a car that wasn't running, you could bring that vehicle there and they would fix it. So when that resource came out, I was all over that. I'm calling them. I'm like, this is great. I have, fa I have so many things need transportation. But I followed back up with my families. One of my families said, Miss Christy, I waited a year, never got anything, never got a response. I met all the qualifications. I took everything you told me to take. I talked to who you told me to talk to. Nothing. Then another family said, I got a car from them, but it was garbage like it kept breaking down it was so unreliable so that's why i say that the tracking piece is very important because i want to know is this working is it not working and you also want to make sure you're providing that feedback to your community partners okay so hey um miss mathis i brought my families to your transportation program but they're saying that these are the issues that they're having they can't easily access the application online. They're not able to get the car. They said they've been waiting. Is there something that we're not doing or we need to change or where do we need to make the adjustments so that we are able to actually access the services? So those are conversations that you would need to have. And for me, I document everything. So if I call Miss Sandra and we talked about it, I'm writing down in my little referral contact sheet on July, what, what is today, y'all? I never know what day it is, I'm so sorry. August, okay, Ebony said August. August, whatever day it is. <laughs> I talked to Ebony, I talked to Ariana, and she said they will fix the referral process, they will make sure the applications go through, they will follow up with family A, B, and Z, and give me a report back at our next community partner meeting or whatever. So then if I send um, Miss Beavers there, and that still is not working, then I know what to, this is not working out for us, okay? I need to make sure that everything is what we need it to be, what we agreed on. So you need to set the expectations for the resources that each group will commit and follow guidelines to track the success of that partnership. So this is all back to the tracking of it because you just don't wanna use anything that's not gonna work, guys. You don't wanna use anything that makes, it, makes your job more difficult. It needs to be easier for us too. Christy, we have a question. Go for it. It says, so if you follow up with the parent and the experience is bad for the family, what happens with that partnership? So you don't want to base it on one family, okay? Because we all know that there, there's going to be issues sometimes. I always say the best customer service is how is the problem corrected? So if the family reports back to you, this is just not working, and you go to the community partner and share their concerns and see where we can work this out, and they are able to resolve it, then we'll keep them. But if they're like, oh, they never get back to you, they're like, okay, we'll work on it, they never work on it, and other families are now starting to complain about the same thing, then we need to let them know this partnership is not being effective for our family, so we're gonna kind of have to end this partnership. So. It's all in like, just like if you bought something from Amazon and it came broken, but you know that, that they return it to you and it's new and they gave you a credit and you're just like, oh, okay. So give them a chance to recover. But in that recovery, if it's not meeting the needs that we have, that's when we would decide to end the partnership, okay? Because ultimately we need to be able to get what, get what we need for our families, but we do need to understand that these are still humans mistakes will happen, things will get overlooked, just like we're busy, any social service agency is going to be super busy as well. And things can happen that they weren't intending to happen, but let me see how you follow through. Let me see how you bring it back. And then that way we can really determine if this is still gonna work for us. Okay, in addition to that, we have another question that kind of relates to what you just said. <laughs> Would you send another family to see if they had the same experience? 
I probably wouldn't send another family until we have worked on a resolution. So let's define what the resolution looks like. So for instance, let's say with the transportation one, I sent a family, at that time I did that, I sent like four families at one time. They all went at the same time and they all had negative responses. If they tell me, okay, we're gonna fix this, we're gonna fix the application, we're gonna make sure that we have a notification system for when your families come in so we are sure to respond within 24 hours. Usually what I did in particular, and I actually did this for that particular one, I tested it out as a family. I pretended to be a family, I went through the whole family process and it wasn't changed. <laughs> so I did not send any more families to them, but I did make sure that they knew that it wasn't changed because you do want them to grow from that. And I think it's a little bit of a better program now to this day. I wouldn't send people to it. I really need to see some positive feedback from other families because I don't do this work anymore, but yeah, it, it wasn't changed. So I have done that. I have role played as a parent and went through the process, what my parents would go through, and see what happens. A lot of times there's a lot of online application and there's things you're sending in before the face-to-face. -face. So I, I kind of went through it and see, and try to see how that would work out and then made the determination from that point too. Was there any more questions, Ms. Nancy? No, so far we're, oh, no, wait a minute. Um, so would you speak with the organization in regards to the negative reviews from our families? And if so, how would you, professionally approach the organization? So I would absolutely speak with them, whoever your community partner lead person is, right? So if I said, if we had already agreed that I'm the lead for Head Start and Santana's the lead for the uh, food program, then that's who I would speak to about. And I would say, listen, I just need to make sure we're on the same page. So we defined that I would do this and you would do this, and I'm having some issues, there's some breakdown in the part of the application or whatever it is. Is there something that you need from me to make that work more seamlessly? So don't be like, you suck, get it together. <laughs> <laughs> but if I say to you, you know, Alana, is there something that I can do to make sure this works better? Because right now I have a few families that are really frustrated. I know you have a really great program and I know we could definitely help each other, but I just wanna make sure I'm making more work for you, not more work on my end, and I don't want a bunch of frustrated families. So it's something that I can do to make that better. And then they'll say, you know what, I'm so sorry, or whatever they'll say. I was out, I had so much going on, I didn't mean for that to happen. People respond better when you don't come at them accusatory, right? If I come at an approach that let's just work together, I'm not saying that you suck, even though I might be thinking that. I might told Nancy that earlier. I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying, what can I do so we can work together because we are partners. We selected you as a partner because we really believe in your mission and we really want to see you grow and what you're trying to do and we want to continue to grow with you. So what can we do to make sure that we can resolve this? If you would prefer, I could have the, pa the family's paperwork sent over from me, and then they meet with you at this time, and they may be like, yeah, that'd be better, because maybe be, there's too many people coming, I just can't keep track. I can keep a spreadsheet, that works better. But what, anytime you redefine your goals, or your objectives, or how a partnership is gonna work, make sure you do it in writing, okay? We don't need to have no verbal conversation, and then you forgot what I just said, because I'm gonna tell you right now, if you say anything to me verbally, I am not a verbal person to where I will retain it. I'm going to forget everything you said <laughs> unless you follow with an email. If I told you I will send you something by email in this training and we can meet up later, I have six children. I have my own business. I work here full time, taking care of my parents. I am not going to remember that, okay? You have to follow it up with a written email, written correspondence, however that's going to be just so we have some accountability as well. Any more questions? Nope, so far we're good. Okay. So then you have, this is a partnership agreement for Pinellas County School District. These are their requirements. These are the things that they need from a partner, and these are the things that they will do for a partner. 
This is the kind of thing that you really want to put in place with any partner. You can go right on their website right now, this is where I got this from, and see what they require for partnerships. Because they're telling me I need to provide tours and do I need to do all of this or pick some or select a few? And this is what they're saying that they're willing to do. Provide notes of thanks, invitations to events, tutors and mentors, provide employees with area on campus to conduct mentoring and tutor. If that meets my needs, okay, I'm good. But it's really good to see and to really get these things kind of written out. And even if you put, for instance, if we put Pinellas County School, what if that was Head Start, that was what we would provide, and we made this our own form, and maybe our qualification for a partner, they need to at least meet two of our needs. If they can hit two of these blocks, we're good. But if they hit two, that doesn't mean we're going to do 30. You know what I mean? So you really need to make sure that it's balanced because you will find yourself in, in a position where you have a second job, <laughs> volunteering at another place, if you don't really define those things. So laying out something like this, I don't know if you guys do this already, and you may already have something similar to this when your partnership agreements are coming into place. But if you don't, this is a really good idea because it kind of lays out what we need and what we're looking for in partners. And if we, could, if we only want one or two of those things, it's fine. But for one or two, if you do this, I'll do this. And we're checking it off and everybody has a copy of that. So we're all on the same page at all times. So this is um, part of your resource book in Pinellas that I picked up. It has like the different programs. So for instance, we'll just stop at the start at the top. Um, this is where I found that food one at actually too. These are financial assistance, right? So the assurance wireless, the category is free wireless cell phone. This is what they do, this is their phone number and this is the type of assistance that they provide. So they say they provide to low income individuals, people that get TANF, um, free or reduced, any of those things. So I kind of make one of these type of charts for myself. So a lot of times the stuff that they put on here, they don't even do this stuff. Sometimes these things are not, all seriously have not been updated in years. And you'll call that number and they'll be like, this is Winn-Dixie. Wait, what? This that assurance <laughs> Numbers are changed, programs are changed. So I create something very similar to this for myself where I'm keeping um, the information. Now, I, um, some of you that have been in training before, I always say about housing, people will always say, oh, I need help with housing. And everybody's first referral was Section 8. We're going to say everybody Section 8. Now, Miss Charlene and Miss Cynthia and Miss Deborah, y'all know that Section 8 ain't never opening back up again. So if somebody needs housing, Section 8 ain't gonna get it, okay? It looks good on paper, it's great to say it, but the reality of the situation is if you need help with housing right now, do not send nobody to no Section 8 because they're not gonna get it. What you do need to do is send people to income-based housing. If you Google income-based housing in your area, there will be a list of apartment complexes that are income-based. That is what you need to do. Those are the people you need to make a relationship with because they determine those housing options internally with the, within themselves. And they sometimes have five and six different properties. So you may go to one and, it ha and they have six different properties all over Pinellas County that people could choose from. And set up a referral process with an income-based housing. All right, that's my alarm saying we have 15 minutes. That's gonna be your best resource. Go meet them. Um, Put your eyelashes on, go out there, smile and grin, hey! Because those are gonna be hard 
partnerships to make because everybody wants them. So you're going to have to bring your A game when you go there. I mean, bring, come with bearing gifts. I brought donuts for everybody. <laughs> I need this resource. I really need to be your partner. Whatever you have to do. All right. So is there any questions, comments, concerns? Now is the time. Sandra says that you have to teach her how to put on eyelashes. I, w I have a YouTube video for <laughs> lashes. I put them on with tweezers, Miss Sandra. I don't know um, how anybody else does it, but I have been teaching Sally how to put them on. Like I've been on a road teaching. I, I learned it from YouTube, but it took me like a whole six months. I almost put my eye out a few times, but I put them on every single day. It is essential for my life. And it's, it's not, van people say, you just, is that vanity? I don't know about y'all, but I'm the kind of person that if I don't dress up, I don't even care if I'm in this house, I feel depressed. I have to dress up for my mental health. And Courtney can speak to how those things kind of, you know, affect your mental health. But I am the person that if I don't get dressed, if I lay in my pajamas, pajamas if I don't do my hair, my makeup, I feel awful. And in quarantine, that, it's it's very much likely to happen and i'm so sick of my children right now so i have to find all kinds of ways to bring myself together like i'm in this is my little office in here see that got my essential oils going my focus my tranquility all of that's blended look over here got my tea station Miss LaShonda just started a tea business. Girl, that tea is amazing. Got my tea area, got my foot. I mean, it's just, this is my calm space. And I actually, I, I divide work and home. So I keep my office door closed. When I come out of here, and I'm done for the day. I turn off the work phone, I close the door. Because especially in this field that you're in, workplace balance is very essential. You have to have workplace balance, you guys. One of the reasons why I left doing case management was because I have no boundaries whatsoever. I, I don't. I can't see people hurting and not. I was picking up people at 2 a.m. I didn't let people move into my house. Uh, Melissa, I didn't. I'm answering phone calls in church. Hold, hold on one second. The pastor's called. I, I, I mean, church, just give me one second because I couldn't handle to see people hurting. It was very difficult for me to have a family call and say, we don't have any food and not take all the food out of my refrigerator. <laughs> my husband's going, we need food. We got money. We'll buy some later. They need something now. And I'm packing up food in the middle of the night. So it became very taxing for me. I was a really good social worker, but the boundaries were, I had to learn how to set them especially having my own family and my own needs. And it, it can be very difficult if you don't really set those boundaries. So especially at home, set your work hours. I'm working this time to this time. And when I'm done, don't call me on this work phone. Well, you can try. But Ariana, I promise you, I will not answer it. It will not be on. You will hear a voicemail. I don't even know if there's a voicemail on here. I closed this door. I'm done. I need to rebuild for the next day, especially in what you guys do. If you don't do self-care, whether it's essential oils or teas or whatever you do, I journal a lot. Those are all ways to rebuild. Like I have to be fresh for the next day. If you don't ever turn it off, you can't turn it back on the next day and be your best self. You just can't. It's impossible to do that. And if I don't turn it off here, I can't turn it on for my kids. You know, they literally are standing at the door right now waiting for me to open this door. Okay. They have, cannot take that they cannot be in here right now. <laughs> they have made a little picnic in the hallway outside this door. If I never close, they can come in and out. Unless I'm training or recording, I ask them to not come in and they are just losing their minds right now sitting in the hallway. All right, do we have more questions? Um, Courtney just gave a tip. It's, she said, keep up with the simple things that make you happy. Yep. Um, Sandra um, had said that she uh, needs to learn how to make those boundaries as well. Yeah. And, and Demasha says that self-care is so important. It really, really is. And Ms. Sandra, you know, I, my supervisor got on me constantly about the boundaries, but what I ended up 
what ended up working for me because my heart is just so big i just i can't i would give you the shirt the eyelashes the everything that i have if somebody compliments me on my necklace i give it to them like i i just that's how my heart is one of the things that worked for me is when i got a family a new family i had to start it from day one so i would say miss delia i'm going to be your case manager but i want to let you know these are my office hours and I would love to help you anytime, but I have kids too. Just like you have kids, I have six kids, I have a husband, and I wanna be the best for you. So I have to turn off my phone during that time, but I promise you I'll turn it back on at eight o'clock the next day, but I need that time for me. And I found that my families were so respectful of my honesty, because I would even say, I will, get back on like I take from three to five to do homework with my kids I said I do pick up because I did family services it was around the family schedule so we didn't have a nine to five like I went to families whenever we went to families I don't know if you guys do that or not but like you we had meetings in the evenings and this and that I said but from three to five I can't meet with anybody because that is the time I do homework and pick up my kids I need to have those afternoon conversations do their check-ins how was their day and all of that so if you can respect that from three to five, I can't talk to you. At six, I can schedule, come see you, home visit, conversations. So I was very upfront from the beginning. And then I didn't have people to test those boundaries. Because they were like, she is just like me. She is a mom. She has kids. She's got, you know, grandchildren. And they were so much more respectful. And then my heart didn't feel strained if something came up, somebody called me at 2 a.m. Because they wouldn't do that anymore. Because they were like, oh, no, no, she said, don't call, I can wait. And they also learned how to figure out some things that I didn't think they could do on their own because I was kind of enabling my families by being that available. That's in any relationship. You can't be that available. You be available during the time that works best for you. If I am available to Courtney because me and her are friends, I'm like, anytime you need me, call me. We say that all the time. No, no, I don't mean that. No, I... People used to laugh when I did case manager. I used to have an answering machine that said, do not, it said, hi, welcome to the Pinckney family. If you're calling between three and five, I'm picking up my kids. We're talking, we're having homework talk. If you're calling between six and seven, I am watching Top Model. Do not call me during this time because I will not talk to you. I love all of you. If you call me back between eight and 5 p.m., Eastern time, I will be more than available and have a beautiful smile through the phone and we will have a candid conversation. And everybody used to laugh about that message, but it was my way of setting those boundaries because some people would still try to call. They get the answer machine. They're like, Christy is a trip. She watching Top Model right now. Let me leave that girl alone. We know how she loves the Top Model. So you, you do what, you set the boundaries that are going to work for you. You can't be a good case manager or face worker if you don't have those boundaries. You're going to be a liked case manager without boundaries, but you are going to be an exhausted, passed out, ineffective case manager <laughs> without boundaries. You'll be doing way more for your families than you should be, and they will never step away from you. They will never be able to do things on their own. So my last point that I want to make is when you're building community partnerships or giving referrals, you always want to make sure the referral is to replace you, okay? I don't refer people to anything that could be temporary if they have a long lasting need. Does that make sense? So for instance, if I am, have a family that struggles every month with having enough food, I am going to refer them to Florida Food Force because I know that referral will surpass them being in Head Start with me. Because Florida Food Force does food every Thursday. If y'all don't know about Florida Food Force, I think y'all, you can use it too. They do food every Thursday. You get six families together. We could actually probably pay it for them. Each family pays $25. They set up a whole little community. And somebody every Thursday goes out to Palm Harbor to the warehouse and picks up all the food. And they give you for, so it's $150 for your group of six, right? I have a lot of friends. We were doing it for a long time. We were giving out, the idea is 
they don't want to give food to just food pantries or people that are just putting it someplace. They want to get it into the hands of people that need it. So they give it to people like us who work, who have good jobs, so that the surplus that we have, we can share with other people. So when you go on third, they call it Thankful Thursday, you drive up to the warehouse, you never get out of your car, you just open the trunk or when, whatever, and they fill up, you get a truckload of food every Thursday. The only problem I have with this is we did not have enough places to put the food. There was just that much. You will get about, for that 150, you get about between seven and nine hundred dollars worth of food every month. But you get it every Thursday. So if I was giving a, a referral for food, that's what I would do. If I know it's something that's long term, I don't want people to feel like I can only succeed in Head Start. I can only do this because Ms. Tawanda helped me. If I know they're going to have a food issue for a long time, Florida Food Force, they can go forever. If you actually have more questions about the Florida Food Force, let me know and I will explain and give you all the information. Um, a lot of people, it's not, it's not income based. You don't need to bring anything but your ID. So let's say that Miss Nancy wanted to do a Florida Food Force group for her and her neighbors. All she does is she brings her ID, she goes down there, and she has her five people's email addresses. And they only use the email just to notify you when there's um, email and phone number. That's just to notify you when they have frozen foods so that you know when you come that you're going to have things need to be refrigerated. That's all. They don't send you anything else. I've never gotten an email other than that or a phone call just to say, hey, we're having frozen foods today, make sure that you have something to put them in or just know that you need to take them straight home or whatever. Um, best food program that I've ever seen. Um, do y'all know who Daphne Fudge is? Dr. Fudge, she does some trainings for Pinellas. Um, I think Neville, y'all remember Neville, right? Neville was in my food group. Neville was in there. We all had this big food group of a bunch of just teacher moms. All my friends teach in elementary school. And we had our own food group plus Neville because, you know, poor somebody got to take care of Neville, y'all. You know, poor little boy. <laughs> he needs somebody to take care of him. And I, we all rotated it off who picked up because we all worked. If you have somebody in a group that doesn't work, then it's perfect. But we all worked. So we picked a day who was going to be picking up on that Thursday because every week, you get this truckload every week, which is where I say the purpose is to give it to families. If you know families that need food, then you automatically have this surplus. They don't want you storing up, Luis. They want you to give it out. If you have neighbors, you have people who have kids at home, you're, I'm making food bags every day, giving them out to people. So it's, I've been out of it for like four months and, I'm, and I still have food. <laughs> I still have food, and I was giving out bags every week. So that it's a really, really great resource. Do we have any more questions, Ms. Nancy? I'm sorry I went on a tangent. No, we don't. Just do you know the code word? Yep. This is my code word. My code word is humble. As Family services staff, we need to always remain humble. We always need to remember that we are all just a paycheck away from being on the other side of that table and treat people with respect at all times. Go into it with, if there is a time that my family needs this, I don't want anyone to ever feel like they're getting a handout. Don't, we don't ever want to treat people like that because we, are the, we can be the customer at any time. Just as we're in this pandemic right now and all the things that are happening to us right now, none of us seen this coming. But a lot of hardworking people don't have jobs now, can't feed their kids. Because there's a lot of kids sitting in this house all day for four or five months. Girl, these kids can eat. I need a job just for food, okay? So you never know when you'll have that need. So always treat people with the respect that you want treat, to be treated with. And you will get that in return. 
people that snap out at you and have a moment with you, there's always something behind that, guys. They had a bad day. Something's going on. Don't take it personally. Just remind yourself, breathe, reset your mind, and do for them what you would want somebody to do for you. If you don't have any more questions, um, do you have my link already for the quiz? Yes, I put it on there, and we just need clarification. Is it Florida Food Source or Force? Florida Food Force. Force. F F F. And if, let's say, Miss Melissa and her faces team decide they're going to do a food group together and give the excess to their neighbors or people that they know. And then she tells Miss Charlene, Charlene uses the name of Melissa's food group as who's referred her. And then Melissa gets a whole free carload. Okay? Every time another group is referred by your group, you get free carloads. At one point, we had six free carloads in one month. Like, we were swamped with food. We took it to the church and did, like, goodie bags and stuff for, for um, vacation Bible school. But that will happen because as you tell people, everybody's like, that's amazing. Let's do it. And there's no catch. There's no income. They don't care what you make. They don't care if you make $100,000 a year. All they really want to know is that people are sharing the food with people that need it. Because a lot of people like us who may need it won't say it. People that are working class people that don't qualify for food stamps, may still have those needs because when you're in that bracket where you don't get no assistance you still need some help but they ain't giving you nothing those are the families that they're trying to reach those are our friends they know that our friend will say to us hey christy i, I really need some food and i will give it to them and there's no shame they don't they're not humiliated nothing they got what they needed so that's the reason what behind that's the mission behind the florida food force is to hit those families that aren't getting food stamps and aren't getting assistance, but still have a need. And they give you so, so much stuff. You will need some kind of pantry or extra storage area for it. And then we met at my house and we would sort the food together and moms were all talking and having a good time and I would put some snacks out. And it was, it's about building community too. So it's, it's a really, really good, a really, really wonderful resource and a great program. Um, any other questions? No.